Okay, I think um, it's time to start the next uh, session on immunobiology and host uh, genomics. I am uh, Kath Bollard. I'm the director for the Center for Cancer and Immunology Research here at Children's National. And it's my great pleasure to introduce the first speaker, who is Dr. Jeff Cohen. He is the chief of, laboratory, uh, of the Laboratory of Infectious Diseases at NIAID and the National Institutes of Health. It is a great pleasure to introduce my friend and collaborator, Jeff, who will talk about the antibody response to SARS-CoV-2. Over to you, Jeff. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kath. I uh, really appreciate the uh, honor to present today. Uh, as you mentioned, I'll be talking about the antibody response to SARS-CoV-2. And shown here on the uh, left panel is a cartoon of SARS-CoV-2. Um, and what we'll talk about today particularly is the spike protein shown here, um, which decorates the outside of the virus and gives the virus its name because it forms a corona, as well as the nucleocapsid protein, which is shown in brown, which binds to the RNA. The spike protein is the, most, is the major target for neutralizing antibody, and it's the best viral protein antibody to predict protection from infection and has been used for screening immune plasma. The nucleocapsid protein is the most abundant viral protein, and there are about 10 times as many copies of the nucleocapsid protein as the spike protein. The nucleocapsid protein is the most abundant uh, protein, as I mentioned, and as a result, it's probably the most sensitive uh, protein in terms of serologic assays for both uh, SARS-CoV-2 and for other coronaviruses. And it's probably the best antibody for serosurveys for early infections. Now, the SARS-CoV-2 encodes many other proteins, including the membrane protein, um, the envelope protein, and many non-structural proteins. But the spike and the nucleocapsid protein are particularly important for antibody assays. And as I'll mention later on, the spike protein has a number of different domains here, and the receptor binding domain, which binds to the ACE2 receptor, is a key uh, target for neutralizing antibody. So multiple antibody assays have been approved um, as emergency use authorizations by the FDA for SARS-CoV-2. And as a couple of days ago, there were 48 assays that have been approved. Um, these include assays like the um, ELISA assay um, shown here, where you can uh, put a protein on, or antigen on a plate, put serum over the plate and the antibodies will bind. And then a second antibody that's labeled with an enzyme can bind. Um, there are a number of different other assays that are approved by the FDA under EUA. And a very recent uh, assay that was approved um, is, is the lateral flow diffusion assay, which was recently approved as a point of care assay. That is, it can be done in 15 to 20 minutes in a doctor's office or a clinic, as opposed to these assays, which are sent out to central labs. This lateral flow assay involves putting a spot of of blood onto the, um, into the chamber here. It diffuses across, and depending on the lines that are seen here, uh, one gets a positive or negative result, but not a quantitative result. This has the advantage of getting a very rapid result, but is, is less sensitive than the other assays shown here. Many of the ELISA assays that I'm going to show involve using the full-length spike protein, and oftentimes it's modified so that the furin cleavage site is deleted. Uh, there's a prefusion stabilization mutations that are made, and oftentimes the trimeric form, which is the natural form of the protein, uh, is used in ELISA by putting a bacteriophage T4 trimerization domain in it. Other assays use just the receptor binding domain shown here. So in our lab, uh, working with Peter Rebello, we developed a different assay, a luciferase immunoprecipitation system assay. And here what we do is we clone the viral nucleocapsid or the spike protein in line with the uh, ranilla, which is a um, uh, ranilla luciferase, to form a fusion protein. So mammalian cells are transfected with the plasmid, we prepare lysates, and we incubate these lysates with serum or plasma from individuals, um, and we then uh, add protein AG, which um, binds to the uh, FC portion of the antibody 
And of course, the antibodies bound to a nucleocapsid protein here. We can then bring these down by a vacuum filtration. And then we add a, we add a, a substrate for ranilla, coelenterazyme. And by measuring the amount of light or light units, this is proportional to the amount of antibody that's been able to bind to the nucleocapsid. So this assay, um, by being made by, be, by the protein being made by mammalian cells, we have the post-translational modifications of the nucleocapsid present, which are often not present um, in ELISA assay or peptide-based assays. And this assay is highly quantitative. Um, and it's also done in solution so that one can get the uh, native confirmation of the protein. So using this assay, we did a study with um, negative controls, which were blood bank donors prior to, 19, 18, prior to 2018, excuse me, and a number of other samples, particularly PCR positive samples from San Diego, University of Washington, Evergreen Healthcare, and from patients at NIH. And this is the results um, of the assay for nucleocapsid antibody and spike antibody. And you can see in black uh, are patients who were four, greater than 14 days after the onset of symptoms. And what you can see in black here is that all the patients greater than 14 days are shown above the cutoff line and therefore had a positive value for antibody here. In contrast, when we looked at individuals who were less than or equal to 14 days after the onset of symptoms, while many were positive in the assay, um, others were negative in the assay here. Um, and this, we also looked at um, antibody to the spike um, protein. And again, um, you can see in black, um, that after 14 days afterwards, one set of symptoms, most of the individuals are positive, but there are a couple that are, are still negative here. Um, so when one looks at the final data, you can see that the sensitivity assay using the nucleocapsid antibody or um, gives you an, a sensitivity of 100% and a specificity of 100%, whereas the spike antibody was a little bit less sensitive, but equally specific. However, when you look at less than 14 days after the onset of symptoms, you can see that the sensitivity goes down quite a bit, but the specificity is maintained. So we then looked over time at individuals at NIH, and here you can see the day after the onset of symptoms, the light units, which is the amount of antibody. And you can see here that um, over time, uh, the, um, the spike antibody goes up, and it comes up a little bit earlier I'm sorry, the nucleocapsid antibody comes up a little bit earlier than the spike antibody in these individuals, whether they're immunocompetent or immunocompromised. And when we compare the immunocompromised patients to the immunocompetent patients, we can see that the slope of the curve here is a little more shallow than what we see in immunocompetent patients. And that is that the antibodies come up a little bit slower in immunocompromised patients, but they do eventually um, do um, come up and be positive. So um, we've gone on to try to look at the specificity of the assay a little bit. And in our LIPS assay, when we looked at individuals who were acutely infected with other coronaviruses, HKU1 or NL63, we found using our assay that none of the individuals um, were seropositive for SARS-CoV-2. And using IVIG, which is pooled immunoglobulin or plasma from over a thousand donors, we also did not see evidence of antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. Now, other um, groups have also, of course, looked at antibodies. And studies done by Caitlin Sattler, uh, which is shown here, um, showed that individuals um, pre-SARS-CoV-2 um, had antibodies to OC43. And this is a heat map where you can see that uh, the vast majority of the individuals um, did have antibody to OC43 coronavirus or HKU1 coronavirus. But these same individuals, um, and again, these are the dates when the blood was drawn, um, did not have antibody to SARS-CoV-2 using the receptor binding domain immunoglobulin. These are positive controls here. And only one of 100 individuals um, pre-2019 had antibody to spike um, from SARS-CoV-2. So we see very little, if any, cross-reactivity in terms of antibodies um, to other um, coronaviruses. In contrast, as we'll probably hear from um, Mike Keller next, um, cross-reactivity of T cells does occur in, patient, in persons with other coronaviruses. 
So why are antibody studies important for COVID-19? Um, well, seroprevalence studies can determine the percentage of the population that has been infected with the virus and may help to predict the percentage of individuals susceptible to infection and disease. Um, correlating the antibody levels that are protective or not protective can provide a benchmark on what levels of antibody is needed for a protective vaccine. Measurements of the rate of decline in antibody levels may indicate when persons might become reinfected with the virus. The presence of antibody may predict reduced virus shedding even when infected, and antibody titers may identify convalescent plasma that is more effective for treatment. Now, recently, the uh, Infectious Disease Society of America came out with some indications or potential indications for uh, serologic tests. Um, and they, they report that evaluation of patients with high clinical suspicion of COVID-19 when uh, molecular diagnostic testing is negative and individuals are at least two weeks after the onset of symptoms um, have passed might be useful. And they recommend um, serology using IgG with or without IgM antibodies, but not IgM antibodies alone. In addition, uh, individuals with multisystemic inflammatory syndrome in children, um, sometimes these individuals are negative um, by RT-PCR, but they can be positive by serology because sometimes they're diagnosed relatively late. And again, um, these antibody tests can be useful for sero sero surveillance studies. Um, however, there are a number of caveats for antibody studies, and it's unknown at the present time whether antibody can actually protect from infection or disease, and I'll touch on this later in the talk. If antibody is protective, it's not clear whether it protects by preventing virus from binding to cells, that is, whether it's by the neutralizing activity, or whether there are other features of antibody might be protective, such as binding to virus-infected cells and killing them, which is referred to as antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity or other activities. In addition, measuring levels of antibody binding to the nucleocapsid or spike protein may not correlate with protective functions of antibodies, and not all antibodies neutralize or mediate ADCC. It's important to note that antibodies that are measured in the blood, which is what most of us measure, may not correlate with antibodies at the site of infection, which is probably more important, that is the nose or the conjunctiva. Um, just because an individual has antibody at one point in time doesn't mean it's going to necessarily persist. And there are all, multiple other immune functions, and particularly T cells, which might be more important for an antibody to actually reduce disease. We think antibody is important for preventing infection, but for the severity of the disease, um, T cells also likely play a very important role. So we've been doing some studies at NIH um, using our uh, antibody assays. And we've enrolled a number of healthcare workers beginning in April 2020 to the present who had no history of SARS-CoV-2. And these studies have been led by Lesha Dropolich, the principal investigator on the trials, and by uh, Krista Gangler, who's our uh, study coordinator. We serious sample individuals every month, and 55% um, of the healthcare workers had no known exposures, 21% had exposures to patients, uh, with SARS-CoV-2, 10% to a coworker, 8% to persons outside of NIH. And so far, we found a seropositivity rate in healthcare workers of 3.8%. Larger studies have been done by the CDC, one of which is shown here. Um, in the light blue, we look at, we can see the percentage of seroprevalence of healthcare workers who were, had known exposures to patients with SARS-CoV-2. And you can see, depending on where the site was, where the study was done, uh, where these patients, where these healthcare workers are seen, the rates vary from 33% of healthcare workers seropositive to down to just a couple percent here. And on average, um, the overall percentage of healthcare worker positivity was 6% using a spike ELISA. In the dark blue, you can see that the rates of, uh, of infection uh, per 100,000 population, for 1,000 populations in these communities are shown here in dark blue. Um, and it turns out that the infections in healthcare workers were associated with a shortage of personal protective equipment and healthcare workers, particularly early on in the SARS epidemic, um, not wearing masks. So these are the results of healthcare workers. Um, 
And just recently, there was a publication in The Lancet of the first US-wide serous survey of SARS-CoV-2. These are 28,000 uh, randomly selected adult dialysis patients. And all of these patients were, uh, blood was obtained in July of 2020. They did a receptor binding domain, um, total antibody that is IgG, IgM, chemiluminescent assay. And um, a higher proportion of persons were sampled uh, who were older, who were men and persons in black and Hispanic neighborhoods than the US adult population. And you can see here for each state, um, uh, the percentage of individuals who were seropositive. Um, and you can see some states which are shown in white were actually not tested. The highest rates were actually seen in New York with 33.6% and in the District of Columbia with 21.3%. Overall, the seroprevalence was 9.3% based on the US population. And it's estimated that 9.2% of these seropositive persons had been diagnosed. So only about 9% of these individuals had been diagnosed previously before this serous survey was done um, based on um, JHU case, count, case count, counts. So a relatively small number of individuals um, had been had known to have SARS and that's consistent with what we heard from Tony about the relatively large number of asymptomatic individuals. So we've done a study um, at NIH of individuals that is employees at NIH who've recovered from SARS-CoV-2 and had a positive PCR uh, test. And uh, of the 23 of the 26 individuals or 88% had uh, antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. And all but one of the antibody positive uh, employees had antibodies that recognized both the spike and the nucleocapsid protein. And interestingly, three of the employees without detectable antibody who were PCR positive were asymptomatic. And it's, as we'll hear about, asymptomatic individuals are less likely to have robust um, antibody responses. So we've taken these individuals who have had three or more time points um, that is where their antibody has been tested, and we graphed the uh, antibody levels over time since the date of uh, symptom onset. And what we found was that the nucleocapsid antibody titer actually fell over time. But surprisingly, the antibody to the spike uh, was relatively constant over time. Uh, we've since looked at a different cohort of individuals, um, and we found the same thing, that the spike antibody um, seems to be relatively constant over time. Uh, and we really don't understand the difference between these two antibodies, why one would be um, relatively constant and one would, one would fall. Now, a number of other, other studies have looked at antibody duration over time. A study from China, uh, asymptomatic patients found that antibodies levels declined. A study from UCLA found antibodies levels declining. But the largest study to date, which was published in New England Journal just a few weeks ago, screened 30,000 people from Iceland um, they used an ELISA antibody to the receptor binding domain, and they um, looked at individuals who were hospitalized, shown here, and you can see the antibodies levels go up in the first three weeks during hospitalization. But more importantly, they looked at individuals over 125 days, and these were individuals that were either hospitalized um, or were seen in the out, um, outpatient setting um, or had undiagnosed infections. And what they found was the antibody levels tend to go up um, during the first 60 days. You can see a rise in the curve, but between day 60 and day 120, the antibody levels were relatively constant. So this gives us some hope that the antibodies may persist for some period of time. This is with SARS-CoV-2. Um, studies have been done over longer periods of time uh, with seasonal coronavirus antibodies. Um, in this study, um, they followed 10 men over 35 years from 19, um, 60, 1985 to 2020 and measured antibodies to the nucleocapsid over, over this time period. And they defined reinfection as a greater than or equal to 1.2 fold change in the ELISA titer to these seasonal coronaviruses. So here's NL63 and each of these are different seasonal coronaviruses and this is measles virus. These are the antibody levels. And when there's a, a one, greater than 1.4 fold increase, um, that's considered a reinfection. So you can see patient nine has multiple reinfections based on this definition. Um, 
And when they looked at all the 10 individuals and each of these dots represents a reinfection, they found that the median time to reinfection was about 30 to 55 months um, shown here in these black lines, but some individuals were reinfected as early as a year um, after primary infection with one of the coronaviruses. So we've studied um, serology assays in, in many other cohorts now. One of them is a cohort from Italy, from Brescia, Italy, um, and this is a collaboration with other investigators at NIAID. And we looked at the um, antibody levels um, in people who were in the ICU who were versus non-ICU. And you can see that ICU patients had a higher level of antibody compared to non-ICU patients, whether measured to nucleocapsid or to spike. Now, um, what's important also are other, uh, other correlations with antibody levels. And this is just some of the literature. Antibodies to um, RBD, uh, antibodies correlated with a decrease in rna -emia, um, that is viral RNA in the peripheral blood, uh, men, um, older, older individuals and people who are hospitalized with SARS-CoV-2 had increased antibody responses. Um, here you can see that um, children tend to have lower antibodies than adults. Uh, persons with mild symptoms um, had reduced antibody responses um, compared to those who had um, more severe symptoms. And children with multi-systemic um, multi inflammatory syndrome um, had higher antibody levels compared to children with severe COVID-2, probably because of a longer time of onset from infection in people when they were measured with MISC. Now, in addition to neutralizing antibodies, there's other antibodies like complement-dependent, complement-mediated cellular cytotoxicity, antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity, or antibody-dependent cellular phagocytosis. Um, and there's also mucosal antibody, again, at the site of infection, as well as cellular immunity. As, and as mentioned, most vaccine studies just look at antibodies or T cells in the blood. So this is a study where they looked at other, um, other antibodies that have different functions, um, including antibody-dependent cellular phagocytosis, um, antibody-dependent neutrophil phagocytosis, and other activities. And they didn't see a correlation between individuals who were um, convalescent shown here versus deceased individuals when they looked at individual antibody functions. But when they pooled the data, they found that individuals that had multiple um, antibodies that recognized the spike protein um, had a better outcome um, and were more likely to survive than individuals that had um, antibodies predominantly to the nucleocapsid protein. And in a separate cohort, um, this was confirmed. Uh, now, neutralizing antibodies are thought to be important for protection from SARS-CoV-2. Most neutralizing antibodies are to the receptor binding domain. Some are against the N-terminus. And when one looks at um, antibodies that are measured to the spike or the nucleocapsid in the LIPS assay or ELISA assays, they tend to correlate uh, with neutralization, um, as you can see here. And the spike proteins tend to correlate a little bit better um, antibodies than the nuclear nucleocapsid antibodies. So what do we know about correlating antibodies with protection from infection? Um, these are four challenge studies with seasonal coronavirus. Um, the first showed that many patients with, with no low neutralizing antibodies excreted virus after challenge compared to only one of four with pre-exposure um, neutralizing antibody levels. Persons with neutralizing antibody levels to the seasonal coronavirus had less infection and were more often symptomatic after challenge. After challenge, neutralizing antibodies peaked at three weeks and fell considerably at 12 weeks. And when these individuals were challenged one year later, um, many of the volunteers became reinfected, but they were all asymptomatic and shedding was much reduced in terms of duration compared to the initial challenge. And finally, fewer individuals with higher titers experience significant colds upon challenge compared to those with low titers. Now, the only study that I'm aware of looking at neutralizing antibody and protection against COVID-19 was, was, was put on uh, line recently. These were 122 uh, persons on a fishing boat that were tested for antibody and uh, COVID-19 RNA before departing and at the time of return. On day 18, the, shipping, the ship returned to shore and 104 individuals um, became sick and 104 were PCR positive for COVID-19 after return for an attack rate of 85. 
If you look pre-departure, three of the individuals had neutralizing antibodies and none were infected. 117 of individuals um, did not have neutralizing antibodies when the ship went out and 103 were um, infected. So there was a strong correlation between neutralizing antibody and protection that was highly significant. So to summarize, many assays are available to measure antibodies. The rate of uh, COVID-19 serology um, at NIH in healthcare workers is 3%. Um, in, in healthcare workers who were exposed in a national study it was 6%. In dialysis patients in the US, 9%. Um, people who are symptomatic are more likely to have antibody. Uh, persons with severe COVID-19 are more likely to have high levels of antibodies. Um, these assays correlate with neutralizing antibodies. Antibody levels decline over time in small studies. In that large study in Iceland, they seem to be relatively constant. Um, neutralizing antibodies correlate protection in one study, but more studies are needed. So this is the work of many individuals, and I really don't have time to thank, thank them. So I will stop here, and thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Jeff. That was great. So the next speaker, we're going from humoral immunity to innate and adaptive immunity. So it's my pleasure to introduce Mike Keller, who's an associate professor in the Division of Allergy and Immunology and in the Center for Cancer and Immunology Research here at Children's National. He's going to talk today about the cellular response to SARS-CoV-2. Thanks, Mike. Thank you so much to the organizers for the invitation to speak to you today about this topic. So here are my disclosures. I will be speaking about developing phase one studies uh, in, uh, in immunotherapy, among other things. So in the current pandemic, establishing the essential components of protective immune response to SARS-CoV-2 has been of critical importance. We've just heard an excellent update on the role of antibody-mediated immunity from Dr. Cohen, but the cellular immune response is also essential for combating many acute viral infections and establishing lasting immunity. So what role does cellular immunity serve in the response to the SARS-CoV-2 virus? It's been described in many large clinical reports to date that lymphopenia is a common feature in acute COVID-19. As shown in the graphs on the left here, lymphopenia tends to be most pronounced in severe cases, and though all lymphocytes uh, populations are suppressed, CD8 T cells tend to be the most severely affected. Interestingly, a report from Wuhan demonstrated that the degree of lymphopenia correlated with C-reactive protein and serum IL-6 levels, as shown here on the right. In spite of the lymphopenia, several T-cell populations have been noted to be enriched in the peripheral blood of patients with COVID-19 infection. As shown in this effect size graph on the left, activated CD8 T-cells and effector memory CD4 cells tend to be proportionally increased in patients and by a single cell RNA sequencing from bronchial alveolar lavage fluid in COVID-19 patients, uh, it was demonstra demonstrated that the, there are clonally expanded activated CD8 T cells in moderate cases, as shown in brown in this graph, graph on the right. In comparison, in severe cases, T cells were more heterogeneous and less clonal. Uh, furthermore, the chemokines in the lungs of moderate patients were more skewed toward T cell chemoattractants, such as CXCL16, uh, compared with severe cases. Natural killer cells are also known to play an important role in antiviral immunity. Immunologists at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden evaluated the NK phenotype of 44 patients with COVID-19. They demonstrated absolute NK cell lymphopenia in moderate to severe cases, as shown in the graph on the left. They also saw increased activated proportions of CD56 bright and mature CD56 dim natural killer cells in the peripheral blood, as shown in this heat map on the right in which controls are in white along the right axis, moderate cases are in orange, and severe cases in red. As shown along the y-axis, service activation markers such as HLA-DR, CD69, and CD25 were highly upregulated in both NK populations, as were cytotoxic proteins perforin and granzyme B. In the same study, both serum IL-6 and clinical severity correlated with a portion of armed CD56 bright natural killer cells expressing perfin and granzyme, as shown in these graphs on the left here. This is confirmed in the airways as well, as by single cell RNA sequencing data from moderate and severe COVID-19 patients confirmed the enrichment of activated natural killer cells, uh, as, as well and, uh, in, um, as, as shown in the graph on the right, uh, in which uh, the transcriptional patterns are consistent with active and inf inflamed NK cells, uh, which were highly significant. 
whereas conventional cytokine producing and terminally differentiated natural killer cells were less apparent. So in summary, both T cells and natural killer cells are clearly engaged in individuals with acute COVID-19. But what exactly does the virus T cell population look like? In the original SARS epidemic in 2003 to 2004, survivors developed strong CD4 and CD8 T cell responses, recognizing structural viral proteins, including spike and nucleic capsid protein, as shown on the, uh, on the upper left, as well as non-structural proteins. Notably, illness severity seemed to correlate with the magnitude of the CD4 spike response, as shown on the lower left, uh, whereas CD8 response did not. On follow-up studies, survivors still had robust T cell responses four years after illness, as shown in the right. And a more recent study from Singapore suggested that this immunity may last for decades. In the late spring, the first report surfaced of SARS-CoV-2 specific T cell immunity in acute and convalescent patients. And now 12 published and, and pre-publication reports have confirmed the presence of T cell immunity following COVID-19 infection. As shown in these upper figures, the SETE group at La Jolla Institute of Immunology first described both CD4 and CD8 T cells targeting both spike and non-spike proteins in 10 patients. Notably, they also saw T cells targeting SARS-CoV-2 in many unexposed control subjects, albeit at very low levels. They also, uh, they also demonstrated correlation between spike antibody and T cell responses. Subsequent reports in Europe demonstrated responses to spike protein in most convalescent patients and also confirmed the presence of low-level responses in many un unexposed individuals. Most recently, a study from the UK demonstrated correlation of T-cell and antibody responses to multiple antigens, including spike and nuclear protein, as shown on the left, and furthermore demonstrated that antigen-specific CD8 T-cells were significantly lower in severe cases in comparison to mild cases. Though not definitive, this suggests that CD8 mediated immunity may potentially influence disease severity. Following the findings of SARS-CoV-2 specific T cells in many unexposed subjects, a follow-up study from La Jolla demonstrated that many CD4 restricted epitopes from common circulating coronaviruses such as OC43 and HKU1 are cross-reactive with homologous peptides from SARS-CoV-2. As shown in the graph on the left, spike epitopes were more highly cross-reactive than non-spike epitopes. As in previous studies, the proportion of these T-cell epitopes was lower in unexposed donors, shown in white in the middle graph, uh, than convalescent patients, shown in red. Uh, the right graph shows that these responding cells were predominantly effector memory T-cells with smaller central memory populations. However, whether these cells truly modify clinical disease remains unknown. Of note, early reports from vaccine trials have also demonstrated induction of T-cell immunity. On the right, it was seen that in patients who received the mRNA-1273 vaccine, T-cells recognizing the spike S1 and S2 domains were detectable by a month post-vaccination. In patients who received the Oxford recombinant uh, adenoviral vaccine, T-cell responses peaked at two weeks post-vaccination, as shown on the left, and remained detectable for up to two months. Though many studies have shown the presence of antigen-specific T-cells, the question remains, how critical is T-cell immunity in and of itself to clearance and protection from COVID-19? The importance of T-cell immunity to antiviral defense is highlighted by patients with moderate to severe inborn errors of immunity and patients who have undergone bone marrow transplant and whom viral infections can be potentially deadly and represent a leading cause of post-transplant mortality. There have been many efforts to determine if immunocompromised patients are at higher risk for morbidity and mortality from COVID-19. Two registered reports on patients with inborn errors of immunity have shown high rates of hospitalization rates in the range of 50 to 60 percent and 10 to 20 percent mortality rates. In these patients, risk factors for mortality were similar to the general population, including age, diabetes, presence of renal disease. Notably also, baseline ALC was found to be a risk factor. In those with secondary immunodeficiency, an earlier report from China reported higher mortality rates in patients with lung cancer and on those uh, who were receiving immune checkpoint inhibitors, as shown in the lower left. A UK registry also reported high hospitalization rates and mortality rates in those with secondary immunodeficiency. There have also been small reports regarding prolonged illness and prolonged PCR positivity, often for well over a month, as shown in the graph in the lower right, in patients post solid organ transplantation, suggesting that this population may be at particularly high risk. So since the beginning of the pandemic, our group has been asking, 
can SARS-CoV-2 specific T cells potentially be harnessed to protect our immunocompromised population? To study T cell responses to SARS-CoV-2, we evaluated 46 adult patients in the region who had recovered from COVID-19 infection. This work was done in collaboration with, our, with the laboratories of Dr. Jeff Cohen and Peter Burbolo at NIH. Most of these individuals were young and had mild symptoms, including fever and respiratory symptoms. Only two required hospitalization. We tested subjects at a median of one month after recovery. As you see on the graph on the right, 33 of 46 had antibody responses to spike and or, and or nucleocapsid uh, when we were, they were tested. To, to evaluate T cell responses, we sought to generate coronavirus specific T cells. This was done using a rapid expansion method in which peptide libraries encompassing the four structural viral proteins, spike, envelope, membrane, and nucleocapsid, uh, were used to stimulate peripheral blood leukocytes, which are then expanded with cytokines in a bioreactor for 10 to 12 days. For the peptide libraries, we utilized the Wuhan H1 reference sequence. Following stimulation and expansion of coronavirus specific T cells, specific T cell activity against SARS-CoV-2 structural proteins were detected in 32 of the 46 convalescent patients and two of 15 control subjects via interferon gamma LA spot as shown here. Convalescent donors predominantly responded to membrane 27 of 46, followed by spike in 12 patients and nucleocapsid in 10. The two control subjects uh, who are shown here also responded to spike protein. Post-expansion T cells were predominantly CD4, with the predominant CD4 uh, T cell population being CXCR3 positive, CCR6 negative, consistent with a Th1 population. On, re on re-stimulation with the viral peptides, these coronavirus T cells produced interferon gamma and TNF alpha, as shown uh, on this graph in the upper right. Of note, we had two subjects who, uh, for whom we had banked cells from prior to the pandemic and who demonstrated a clear primary response following COVID-19 infection. Subject 46 had a mild case of COVID-19 and following recovery had a robust response to spike, membrane, and nucleocapsid antigen as shown here on the, in the upper graph, as well as robust antibody response to spike and nucleocapsid at 57 days after onset of symptoms. Overall, 26 subjects had both T-cell and antibody responses following recovery, and an additional six donors had T-cell responses without seroconversion. When comparing the seropositive and seronegative subjects, we noted, noticed that the response to non-spike antigen was much more likely in the seropositive individuals, which was highly statistically significant. And this supports that T-cell and antibody responses are tied, which undoubtedly reflects the activity of T-follicular helper cells. We also performed epitope mapping of individual antigens to determine the regions of the viral proteins that were being targeted and noticed several epitopes within the membrane C-terminal intervirion domain that represented hotspots and were recognized by 14 of the 46 donors that we evaluated. These were highly conserved regions of the virus and were determined to be CD4 restricted by intracellular staining as shown on the lower right. Of note, uh, other reports have now also identified this region as a hotspot. In total, we found 14 novel epitopes in membrane, spike, and nucleocapsid. To determine if these epitopes were cross-reactive with mutant viruses and related coronaviruses, we tested published variants in the epitopes from circulating SARS-CoV-2 genotypes. In the graph on the left, the variant epitopes from, with mutations, uh, shown in red, uh, are listed under the wild-type epitope. And you can see that response based on the interferon gamma LA spot magnitude for these three variant epitopes is actually greater than the wild-type epitope, suggesting strong cross-reactivity. Comparably, uh, homologous epitopes uh, from nucleocapsid in common coronaviruses NL63 and OC43, as shown on the right, did not show notable cross-reactivity. So in summary, T-cell immunity is detectable in most convalescent individuals and shows a distinct immunologic hierarchy that correlates with seroconversion. We've also shown that it's quite feasible to produce coronavirus with T cells for most convalescent patients. However, there are several key questions remaining. First, is T cell immunity protective in and of itself against COVID-19? If so, how long does this protection persist? Is T cell immunity common coronavirus truly protective against SARS-CoV-2? And lastly, what is the role of T and NK cells in acute res respiratory distress syndrome and other inflammatory com complications, such as multisystemic inflammatory syndrome in children. 
Though there are many unresolved questions, several immunotherapy trials targeting COVID-19 are underway with more development. Uh, at Johns Hopkins, two patients with ARDS were treated with cord blood-derived T regulatory cells with improvement in their cytokine profiles after infusion, and both patients were uh, subsequently uh, improved. Uh, current phase one uh, studies uh, that are in development or currently recruiting include T regulatory cells, SARS-CoV-2 specific T cells, mesenchymal stem cells, and natural killer cell therapy. Five of these studies are already recruiting to date. We also plan to advance uh, this, uh, this to a potential immunotherapy trial for prevention or treatment of COVID-19 in immunocompromised patients with either donor-derived coronavirus T cells following bone marrow transplant or third-party coronavirus T cells for treatment of early disease with the goal of preventing progression and, re and reducing prolonged viral shedding in this population. So with that, I'd like to thank Dr. Bullard, our collaborators at the NIH, and our extraordinary group at Children's National at GW, who have continued to come to the lab since the beginning of the pandemic and worked tirelessly to pursue this work, as well as our many referring collaborators, our participating patients, and our funding agencies, the NIH, and, and uh, several there are many foundations, Jeffrey Waddell Foundation, the Katzen Foundation, and the Connor Family Foundation for the support of this work. Thanks very much, Mike. That was excellent. All right, we are keeping well to time, so it's my great pleasure to move on uh, to introduce Helen Sue, who's the Chief of Human Immunologic Disease Section and the Laboratory of Clinical Immunology and Microbiology at the uh, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the NIH. She's going to talk about genomic identification of susceptibility factors in SARS-CoV-2. Helen, over to you. Thank you so much, Kath. Um, I'm just going to share my screen now. All right, um, I want to thank the organizers for the opportunity to today to tell you about some very exciting work and, and, and it, it has been published last week in Science. So uh, please feel free to focus on the overall messages I'm going to tell you about today and um, you can go to the actual papers for details. So as has been um, mentioned beforehand, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection is very interesting because most people who get infected are asymptomatic and, uh, or they have very mild symptoms. But what we're particularly interested in is this small population of people who develop life-threatening disease. And um, as has been alluded earlier, uh, we do know of several risk factors that lead to such an outcome, which include this increasing age, as well as the presence of uh, comorbid conditions like chronic uh, pulmonary disease. And um, it's also been appreciated that um, uh, people of male sex tend to also have uh, a, a poor outcome. So uh, what our goal really is to, to do is to understand in a large population why there are some people that seem to break these rules. So there are people who are older and who have comorbidities and yet um, despite heavy exposure to SARS-CoV-2 apparently remain resistant to infection. And on the other hand, there are other people who are younger and apparently healthy who also develop severe disease. And we hypothesize that these types of people, um, though uh, relatively rare, are uh, people who have a monogenic predisposition to disease or uh, monogenic resistance to disease. Now, um, testing this can be a little bit complicated because it's more uh, likely than not that um, these genetic factors that help uh, contribute to outcome um, may be variably expressed and that, um, uh, that the presence of the factors may not be the only thing that uh, leads to the phenotype. So uh, it is probably rarely a Mendelian type of disorder. Uh, however, um, uh, my group has um, tried to understand this in the context of, as uh, Sarah and others have mentioned, um, uh, collaborations. And um, we are doing this as part of a, um, a consortium at the NIAD uh, in which uh, the, the goal is to understand comprehensively what's going on with innate and adaptive immunity and outcome to infection and really trying to understand SARS-CoV-2 pathogenesis. 
So, um, so I, what we've done is uh, uh, basically freely share data, especially data generated on the same patients to, to get insights in, into um, uh, what's going on. And, um, and, and my group has spearheaded the efforts at trying to understand the genetic basis of disease in these patients. So this was started uh, by a, 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 an effort that Gigi Notarangelo um, uh, spearheaded um, due to uh, very close uh, professional and um, personal relationships. He was able to work very closely with a number of the sites in Northern Italy that were early on hard hit by the pandemic. And it has expanded to include many other sites in Italy as well as other sites outside in um, South America, East Asia, and the United States, including with uh, Sarah, uh, we started to look more uh, at uh, patients that are, are children with Miss C. So um, our, uh, what we did was we built a way in which we could um, uh, perform a whole genome sequencing rather rapidly in collaboration with our, our colleagues, Andy Snow and uh, Clifton Dalgard at the American Genome uh, 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 Center across the street at USIS. And um, that, that data uh, is, is, is growing. We've now sequenced uh, nearly 1,400 patients. Uh, the, uh, the analyses are, are uh, begin with uh, uh, um, at the NIH, and then we share those data with uh, a larger uh, um, collaboration, the COVID human genetic effort that I co-direct with Jean-Laurent Casanova. And this is really important because um, we're looking at relatively rare um, uh, genetic events. And so we really need to be able to share the data and have confidence that any variants that you see are, are, are repeatedly cropping up. And so um, we are um, working with over a hundred sequencing centers um, and many hundreds of participating medical centers that perform whole exome or whole genome sequencing. And the sequences are shared uh, and the analysis are shared. And um, there's actually the investigators amongst us. We uh, dis dis um, discuss findings on a, a weekly basis. So initially, um, the idea was to focus mainly on these outliers who were um, primarily healthy and were young. but um, Gigi and I had a discussion early on. We decided to um, be a little bit looser with our criteria in that this was a, a novel virus. So we reasoned that primary infection might occur in older individuals. And we didn't want to bias our results. We figured that even though there may be other comorbidities that might contribute, that may not necessarily obscure any contribution of genetic effects. And so, um, uh, so we basically uh, had an unbiased enrollment of, of patients through our Italian collaborators. And I think that proved to be a, a, a good decision. Um, and it's been, uh, we, uh, I think the early work that I, I'll describe today is basically shows that um, the genetic determinants for outcome uh, can occur at, at any age and um, maybe um, in, in, despite other comorbidities. Um, so, uh, so anyway, what we have been, um, many of us have focused in the past in, uh, is on Mendelian disease, which is uh, our diseases of the immune system that usually appear very early, and they're, they're due to very rare or novel genetic variants that are highly penetrant. But what we recognize um, from our work in other viral uh, systems that, uh, at least for SARS-CoV-2, it seemed to be very similar in that uh, it was different from the other types of inherited immune uh, disorders that have been previously studied. It appears that um, the infection outcomes uh, may be better represented in this uh, orange uh, circle uh, as a, a, a disease of, uh, due to rare or uncommon variants that um, have an intermediate penetrance. And um, in contrast, there are other investigators in the field who are uh, are and undertaking alternative approaches uh, to studying the genetic basis for SARS-CoV-2 susceptibility by uh, performing genome-wide association studies, which um, it, just to contrast to our approach really is looking at genetic variants that are more common that have a relatively low uh, contribution disease, but cumulatively can uh, result in a certain outcome. 
So um, our approach has, has come from uh, many decades of experience in the field and uh, which have revealed now over 430 monogenic inborn errors of immunity. And they're classified here, as you see in the slide. And I'd like you to focus mainly on the magenta pie piece, which reflects defects in intrinsic and innate immunity. Now, um, unlike some of the other types, categories of primary immunodeficiency diseases, such as uh, the combined immunodeficiencies, which have, can have virus susceptibility, but it gen generally, generally tends to be very broad. The patients get very sick. They have many other problems. People um, in, with these uh, disorders uh, reflecting defects in innate immunity tend to have a, a slightly different picture in that the, the infectious susceptibility tends to be very narrow, uh, probably reflecting um, a narrow uh, defect of their adaptive immunity is generally intact, for instance. And so, um, as you see by this list, there had already been um, uh, many discoveries um, from Casanova lab, our lab, and many other labs uh, identifying patients with selective susceptibility to different viruses, whether herpes simplex encephalitis only, um, problems with warts, uh, other types of viruses. And uh, as I've noted in the red box, there have actually been several patients who uh, seem to be healthy, but then develop a uh, life-threatening infection with um, influenza virus, for instance, or other respiratory viruses, including rhinovirus that our laboratory has studied in the past. So what's really interesting is that you can see by the genes that are uh, variants, the deleterious mutations that are associated with these types of disorders that even some genetic um, mutations can be associated with different virus susceptibility. For instance, uh, patients with influenza virus can have uh, autosomal dominant TR3 TLR3 mutations, and the same exact mutation can um, present as herpes simplex encephalitis um, uh, without any problems with influenza. So, uh, so in many regards, we, there's still a lot that we don't really understand about the genetic basis of um, virus susceptibility uh, that uh, need to be uh, further uh, elucidated, including why a patient presents with one virus or another. But if you just take what is known about these conditions and you put them together, you can see that many of these defects uh, resulting in a very narrow virus susceptibility uh, uh, seem to affect these pathways involved in either virus sensing, interferon, uh, type 1 interferon signal transduction, and um, responsiveness. So you can see here that um, uh, that uh, just to refresh your memory that the in type 1 interferon response starts with sensing viral products, uh, many cases of uh, viral RNAs, you get several molecules that result in the production of type 1 and uh, because of many um, similarities with type 3 interferon signaling, the production of these interferons can either act on the same cell or on neighboring uninfected cells and, um, and then uh, signal through interferon receptors, causing transcriptional changes that render an antiviral state um, by affecting a processes such as translation, transcription, et cetera, even directly on virus replication. So uh, based upon this knowledge, um, Jean Laurent and I had this, uh, had had discussions and we, 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 as the sequences were coming early on, um, primarily from the Italian cohort as well as the French cohort, um, we uh, thought that we would look at this general hypothesis of whether uh, defects in any of these genes that we knew affected type 1 interferon responsiveness might be uh, also responsible for a severe SARS-CoV-2 outcome. And um, I'm, I think that was also underscored by much work done in mouse and in vitro tissue culture systems, uh, pointing to the very uh, the great importance of this pathway. Um, and, and also with work that had been done in um, patients with SARS-CoV-2 infections, showing that it seemed to be perturbed and that perturbations were associated with worse disease. So, in some of the, um, uh, uh, these are uh, data from two publications earlier this year showing that in uh, patients who 
were uh, in, hospitalized in the ICU with uh, COVID-19, that those uh, groups could be stratified into um, ones that um, produce early type one and different responses and those that did not. And this second group tended to be associated with a longer stay in the ICU requirements, uh, greater requirements for ventil ventilatory support, et cetera. And moreover, in additional studies in which uh, uh, patients with different gradations of severity uh, were uh, looked at, you could see that the mo most severe critically ill patients also had decreased interferons, interferon activity, and um, downstream interferon uh, gene transcription uh, independent uh, responses. So um, going back to this, we, uh, we, we initially looked at a panel of 13 uh, genes that could be interconnected to each other through these pathways and had resulted in um, a virus susceptibility with sometimes with different um, non-respiratory viruses. And this, the results are summarized here. So basically in about 600 or so patients with critical illness, there were 23 who had um, mutations in at least eight uh, degenic loci that were, are really important for type one interferon uh, signaling and responsiveness. And you can see here um, that they uh, were both men and women and they included many who were older and in, in the patients that we studied, most of them actually did survive. So uh, some of these mutations had already been shown in previous literature to be pathogenic uh, through functional testing. Others uh, uh, in, the, in the study uh, we performed, uh, we validated them and showed that they had an effect. Uh, many of them were heterozygous resulting in autosomal dominant disease. A few of them were autosomal recessive. And um, I think uh, you can just see that uh, it, it was quite impressive and really satisfying to see that um, uh, that the predictions were correct, that there were genetic lesions in, in these genes that we, we thought would be important for control viral infection. So I don't have time to go through the details, but just to m summarize, um, we could um, use mathematical models in which we're looking at uh, uh, the cumulative frequency of experimentally determined uh, deleterious variants in and, and we could see that these frequencies were enriched in our critically ill COVID-19 patients as compared to those with asymptomatic or mild disease. Um, additional functional studies were shown um, that the effects uh, it resulted in decreased interferon uh, production either in plasma cytoid dendritic cells or in fibroblasts, uh, that they not only produce less interferon, but had impaired ability to limit SARS-CoV-2 replication in vitro. And in a, a few of the uh, can, um, de defects that we focused on, you could put back a wild type uh, 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 gene product into ones that were deficient from our patients and, and show that that could restore the ability to uh, limit replication. So, um, so this is very exciting, but um, what I would like to go on is to tell you that um, the genetic studies, even though in, in the study we showed effects in, the, in at least 3.5% um, of the individuals with critical disease, they have wider implications. And that's because the genetic studies can tell us about the pathways that are involved. And so uh, in a very complementary um, story that uh, uh, the uh, COVID HGE was involved, but at the NIH also particularly involved uh, Steve Holland and his group, and, as well as Mih Mihalis Leonakis. Um, we went on to, to show that um, we could get a phenocopy of the type one interferon defects uh, uh, through the production of autoantibodies. Um, so what happened was that um, Paul Bastard, uh, uh, a very talented uh, a pediatrician in uh, Jean Laurent's group, had, when he was looking early to see what genetic defects uh, were present in, in some of these patients, he saw that there, some of them could potentially have air mutations. And so um, we talked with Mihalis Leonakis, who studies that disease, and he 
was personally involved in several cases of a severe COVID disease in the APS1 patients. And so the idea was, well, these patients generally were already known to have autoantibodies against cytokines, particularly the type 1 interferons. Is there a possibility that um, some of the other patients who have a severe disease but no real obvious genetic defects might have uh, problems also with autoantibodies against um, type 1 interferons. And in the broader context, it there's been precedent from other infectious diseases, such as candidiasis and mycobacteria, in which you do have autoantibodies against cytokines like interferon gamma and IL-17, and that contributes to pathogenesis. And even there were a few reports, Gigi Narangelo had a, had a patient with RAG deficiency that he studied uh, who had severe varicella infection and autoantibodies to type 1 interferons. So to look at that more closely, um, Paul and Lindsay Rosen, an Oxcam student in Steve Holland's lab, undertook a very comprehensive analysis. And this is just showing you the results from the first 400 or so patients, but it was ultimately extended to about 900 to 1,000 critically ill patients. Again, these are, this is through an international consortium. So these um, samples came from patients worldwide. Um, um, and, they were tested for autoantibodies. So Lindsay has a, a multiplex assay, which she can look at autoantibodies to different cytokines at the same time. And I'm just showing you um, five of them, but she's tested many others. And what was really very exciting was is that the COVID patients uh, seem to have uh, over-representation of autoantibodies to type 1 interferons. So as you can see here, about 10% uh, of the patients had autoantibodies to interferon alpha or omega, many times uh, coexisting. And there were very few with um, autoantibodies to beta. Um, but this, you can see um, uh, uh, rather little reactivity to other autoantibodies. So then the big question was, um, was this binding um, doing anything? And so uh, what was done was to show that they were actually neutralizing and um, and this assay, what, what is involved is that you're basically taking a, a responding cell, dumping on interferons, uh, and looking at the ability to respond through um, STAT1 phosphorylation. Normally, um, plasma, 10% of plasma in the culture medium of um, healthy control uh, donors results in no interference with activation of STAT1 by the exogenously added interferon alpha or omega. But in about 10% of our patients, you could see that their plasma suppressed the activation. So here's an individual with autoantibodies um, neutralizing both alpha and omega. And, and another example of a patient who has neutralizing antibodies to alpha, so you don't get STAT1 um, phosphorylation, but um, no, no neutralizing antibodies to omega, and that proceeds quite nicely. So, um, so I think uh, what was also shown is that these autoantibodies are extremely powerful. In vitro, they can neutralize a microgram per mil amounts of interferon. So uh, the other thing that they can do is abolish uh, protection against SARS-CoV-2 replication in vitro. So if you do um, virus infections and you add these um, neutralizing antibodies to interferon, the, basically that virus now proliferates very, very uh, well. Um, and um, what we also saw that these autoantibodies were occurring in um, a little bit older patients, but um, there was an excess representation in males above what you normally see in those who are critically ill. And there were also a, a few patients uh, uh, who had been tested even before SARS-CoV-2 infection who had them at present. And most importantly, if you test patients who have mild or asymptomatic disease, there, uh, I think we tested about uh, 600 or so, and there was none who had these autoantibodies and, and very few in people who were tested uh, even before the um, a SARS-CoV pandemic, only four out of about 1,000 to 100 patients were positive. So that suggests to us that the, the presence of these autoantibodies might be uh, occurring 
before infection and maybe contributing to pathogenicity. And um, obviously there are implications in terms of how you might use that knowledge in terms of treatment or uh, strategies for patients, including uh, ideas of potentially removing these antibodies through plasmapheresis, et cetera, uh, in order to prevent severe disease in patients that might be at higher risk. So um, in summary, I think, I, I, I hope you were, uh, you could see that um, these studies and uh, looking at the genetic basis uh, can give us more insight into disease. Uh, in, in this case with SARS-CoV-2, I think the genetics and the um, phenocopies of the genetics now count for approximately 15% of the critically ill persons. Now we know why they probably get such uh, critical illness. And, uh, and it really points to the importance of type 1 interferon pathway in uh, acute SARS-CoV-2 infection. So, um, so I'm just going to end to saying, uh, again, this was a really a phenomenal effort internationally with many hundreds of people who contributed. Uh, um, and this is just a listing of the, the co-authors. Um, a special thanks uh, to Chen Zhang, who helped spearhead the first study, and um, Paul Bestard, um, uh, the second study, as well as Lindsay Rosen in the second study. Um, we had uh, uh, you know, plenty of uh, clinicians, both in Italy and in France, who actually uh, provided samples and also clinical information that was respons uh, important for allowing us to get uh, traction into our initial uh, hypotheses. Um, many uh, functional studies were done by multiple labs um, uh, besides the Casanova lab and besides our group at the NIH. And um, I think with that, uh, I will end and uh, let people proceed with the panel discussion. Then. Thanks very much, Helen. That was great. So if we all um, turn our videos on those in this session, uh, so Jeff and Mike and Sarah, I have a list of questions, so I'm going to start from the top. So um, I'll start with you, Jeff. Um, so I merged some of the questions from the first session, so you're going to answer some of those as well. One question was related to cross-reactivity between antibodies. So one person wanted clarification that there is no cross-reactivity in the antibody response between SARS-CoV-2 and seasonal coronavirus. Is that correct? You need to take yourself off mute, Jeff. Sorry. Uh, so the there's there's always some cross reactivity in these assays. Um, there's much more cross reactivity between um, SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-1 or MERS, much less so against seasonal coronaviruses. But um, there is a very low level in some, depending on the um, specificity of the assay. Uh, between um, SARS-CoV-2 and seasonal coronaviruses. Usually we don't see much cross-reactivity. And the cross-reactivity tends to be in either the um, S2 um, domain of the spike or in the nucleocapsid region. So then another question, it's sort of a bit more wide ranging. What if people had severe viral infections to say like the flu, whether it be H1N1 or other strains or other respiratory viruses, do we know if, you know, if the, in that setting where you've got high antibody titers, um, they are going to have a, a worse clinical outcome if they were to get SARS-CoV-2? Do you have any data on, you know, a cohort of patients who had perhaps you've tested for other, other viral diseases? Yeah, I'm not aware of any data, but obviously if, if like uh, Helen has mentioned, if someone has a genetic or, or a acquired you know, uh, immunodeficiency that predisposes to more severe viral infections or, or respiratory viral infections in general, they may have more problems dealing with uh, SARS-CoV-2, but I'm not aware of the um, of, of, of direct interactions. Great, thank you. Um, so Mike, uh, one question that came up uh, was related to why, do we know why the BMT population in particular don't seem to have such an aggressive course? There seems to be conflicting data out there on this, um, but do you have any thoughts around this 
related to the inflammatory response, et cetera? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. And, and uh, indeed, uh, I mean, uh, the, the uh, signal in terms, of, uh, in terms of mortality certainly isn't there. Although, I mean, anecdotally, there's, there's many, many, uh, many uh, cases reported of patients with, I mean, of severe disease, but prolonged PCR positivity uh, following a double myo transplant or solid organ transplant. So seemingly, um, innate immunity seems to be more, more critical in, in, in the early, early stages of disease, whereas, uh, whereas adaptive immunity may be more critical in, in controlling it and resolving uh, the, uh, the infection. So Mike, you want to, might want to get a bit closer to your microphone when you answer the next question. <laughs> um, so can you comment more on um, the presence of SARS-CoV-2 T cells in unexposed donors? Could they be protective, um, i.e. helping to prevent COVID as in the disease form? Uh, could they help the population reach herd immunity so sooner? Is this being looked at? That's also a very good question. And uh, so, uh, unfortunately, we really don't know. Uh, like, uh, like that paper mentioned, that, that cross-reactivity was very disproportionately in CD4 T-cells. Less 93% uh, of them were in CD4 epitopes, as opposed, to, uh, as opposed to a lot of the clinical reports have suggested that CD8 immunity seems to, kind of, uh, seems to be more kind of uh, um, preferentially kind of um, um, present in, in, uh, in milder, mild to moderate cases and more suppressed in, um, in severe cases. So the fact that, that, that these cross-reactive these cross epitopes seem to be disproportionately CD4 gives me pause as to whether they will truly be uh, uh, protective. But really, the, uh, long, long, longer term natural history studies are going to be necessary to really know whether or not these are going to be protective. Luckily, the vaccine studies that are ongoing should be very well uh, situated to do some of these studies. So actually, the last question for you two, it's for both of you. So is there data on reinfection in, um, in other than the three reports that are in the media? So we've heard of three people who've you know, had, tested positive, got an immune response, but tested positive again. So in your respective antibody T cell cohorts, uh, T cell immunity cohorts, have you seen this phenomenon and do you think that they are protected from getting severe disease uh, post second infection? So Jeff, maybe you don't want to start with that. Yeah, so I personally have not seen reinfection, but I know of two um, letters to the editor of clinical infectious diseases that have come out recently, one from, uh, describing two patients in India and one describing a patient in um, Fort Belvoir, Virginia that had reinfection. And it's important to sort of document the reinfection is based on uh, the CDC has a criteria that you're more than 90 days apart from your two positive PCR tests and that you either have a virus with a different clade or that has different, uh, sufficient different amino acid uh, nucleotide uh, changes that clearly indicate it's sort of a different um, strain of, of virus that's occurred. So um, I think we're going to be hearing about more cases of reinfection. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you, um, again, I, I think people will be able to get reinfected over time, but I suspect that the reinfections like so those have been reported are going to be much milder, potentially even asymptomatic, and there'll be reduced shedding of virus. So there'll be less, transmis less transmission. Mike, I don't know if you want to comment about memory T cell response and do we think that will help with reinfection? Well, uh, hopefully there's, there should be more, more studies coming out this fall and winter on, on exactly how long T cell immunity lasts. But, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll echo what uh, Dr. Cohen mentioned that, that, that uh, they seemingly uh, patients with mild or asymptomatic disease tend to be the, the, the small percentage that don't have a very robust response. So likely uh, that will be the population that will probably see reinfection uh, cases on. But uh, I, I don't suspect probably that, that there'll be cases where people are asymptomatic and then develop severe disease. That's probably going to be unusual. Right. Thank you. All right, Sarah, um, question for you. Are there reasons as to why males are showing a dominance that was 55%, I believe, uh, in Miss C patients? And the question was, is this related to increased male mortality that is possibly seen in 
in the adult data? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I would argue it's, it's nearly even um, in terms of the, the percentage, although it is a relatively large cohort that they're drawing on there. Um, I, I don't have a great answer to that question. Um, in smaller cohorts, there the, in our cohort, there's actually a mild female predominance um, earlier on. So I don't know that there's a clear answer there. I think that from my perspective, that would be the more interesting question or the question I think is easier to dive into is the, the age range being so narrow. Though we do see a broad age range, it's fascinating that this really happens in a fairly narrow age range generally. Um, but the, the gender predominance, I think we'll have to keep watching the data to see if that pans out. Right. Um, next question for you is, would you expect to see similar immunopathology profiles in Kawasaki's disease, or do you think this is really specific to SARS-CoV-2, Miss C? So I'd mentioned there's a number of folks who've jumped in with both feet to Miss C, um, and the Broden Group has a fantastic cell paper directly comparing historical Kawasaki samples um, to healthy control children, Miss C children, and COVID children. Um, and they did find parallels in some facets of the immune phenotype to, uh, between MIS-C and Kawasaki disease. Um, but in their paper, they described some differences, including differences in T-cell subsets and IL-17 specifically. Um, and I'm sure a lot of folks prospectively will be recruiting, as well as looking retrospectively at their bank samples to get further understanding of this question. Um, but that's the best data I'm aware of, and it's a, it's a great paper to check out. Great, thank you. Um, so Helen, uh, questions for you. Firstly, there was a question that's quite um, specific. I think you mentioned AIRE mutations and antiferon antibodies as a potential mechanism for the sick patients. Is that correct? Actually, it was an observation that Michalis is involved in several cases of uh, patients with APS1 who actually were in the ICU with a critical illness. So, and as um, I, I think it's going to be multiple genetic lesions that may contribute to um, the autoantibodies secondarily resulting in the SARS-CoV-2 susceptibility. So yes, it's, it's actually been shown. It's in the paper, I think, the mentioned about the cases with the, the, um, the APS1 and the neutralizing antibodies. So there's a lot of um, questions in the chat about what, is there a potential for autoantibodies to be present in convalescent plasma or an IVIG, and is this a concern? Yes, of course it is a concern. I, I don't think we have enough data no, to know how long those autoantibodies persist and to what level following um, uh, uh, clearance of infection. Um, so I think those studies need to be to be um, performed, uh, and what is the, the minimum level that you see in an effect? Those are all unknowns, and whether it would, um, you know, be something you would screen in products before you, you make convalescent plasma from those donors, I think we would say probably a good idea. Um, <laughs> uh, did I miss some other part of the question? No, no, that's good. Okay. Um, and then finally for you, are there other respiratory viruses that produce autoantibodies? Uh, yes. Relation with yes. So we, it wasn't included, but there is um, uh, some data from some other infections. I think uh, Jean Laurent's group is going to write that up. Um, Life-threatening other infections, maybe not to the same level uh, of viruses that have autoantibodies. But I just want to stress that our COVID patients who had the autoantibodies had no prior history of problems with other viruses. And it may be because COVID is a novel pathogen and it's particularly virulent that you see it here. So just having autoantibodies, I mean, if, if it, we know that it can pre-exist, but it didn't seem to prevent them from getting flu and dealing okay with that, et cetera. So there are probably other mechanisms that help protect. And, and so it's not necessarily a, a, a bad thing uh, that will affect you with outcome to other viruses. And the other point is I think I was trying to make is that um, many of these innate immune defects like flu susceptibility due to IRF7 mutations, the patients are fine. They get a really bad disease. Um, they're in the ICU and then they get vaccinated and they're on antivirals and they're fine af afterwards. So I think with the innate immune defects, you get your adaptive immunity kicking in later on. So it, it may not be as problematic as your uh, other virus susceptibilities due to adaptive immune defects. Got it. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, okay, Jeff, here's one for you. 
how will the presence of neutralizing antibodies in previously infected patients affect their response to SARS-CoV-2 vaccines when they become available? So I think if a vaccine were a replicating vaccine, having neutralizing antibodies would um, inhibit the replication of a replicating vaccine. And as a result, you'd have much, a much less um, immune response to it, to it. However, the vaccines that we know about that Tony spoke about this morning are not replicating vaccines. Um, so I wouldn't anticipate a problem. The only issue I could think of was if a new strain of SARS-CoV-2 came along um, and people were imprinted, let's say, to uh, the, the current strain, um, a vaccine for a different strain might not induce as good antibodies because you'd already be, be imprinted with another strain has been reported with influenza from the group at University of Pennsylvania. So I tend to think it's not going to be an issue with, a, with the vaccines we have right now. If anything, you will get a boost response if you've already been primed with infection. Um, so another question, I guess it is more for you, Jeff. Um, are the, people are commenting that the, disease, the death rates in some developing countries, especially Africa being a, a case in point outside of South Africa, um, seems lower than what you would expect based on what we're seeing here. Is NIAID collaborating with any centers in, in these developing countries to look into reasons that may be uh, why this is? Yeah, I don't. Probably I, multifactorial for sure. <laughs> yeah, almost certainly it's multifactorial. I don't know off the top of my head, um, particularly for, ex, it would presumably be an extramural um, collaborator at NIAID, and I don't know off the top of my head about that. I can get back to the questioner. Okay, great. Um, so a Miss C question uh, for you, Sarah. Is it possible that vaccinated children will develop Miss C? I would assume that the, the question was regarding a coronavirus vaccine in this case. Correct. Sorry, yes, correct. Yeah, no, no, I just, just want to make sure I'm thinking it through. Um, you know, it is such an incredibly rare complication that we see in children. And I think we understand so poorly why these previously healthy children and not children with chronic health issues and not adults are suffering from this. I think it's very hard to draw any, any clear connection to other events that might happen. Um, so I personally wouldn't expect it, but I, I agree that we have a lot to learn about Miss C to help us understand the pathogenesis better. Um. Here's another B cell related question. Are there, um, so Jeff, do you know, I know there has been some data published, but um, it's sort of more anecdotal. People who've received rituximab or other B cell depleting therapies, are they more susceptible to severe disease or less susceptible? Do, do you have any data yeah. or maybe I mine? I don't know data about rituximab. And again, most, most individuals who get severe virus infections, you know, it's not that they have agam globulinemia, it's that they have impaired T cell um, immunity. Um, however, there is data with, with um, BTK inhibitors, which inhibit, you know, the function of B cells where um, BTK inhibitors have actually shown in people who are already infected, um, at least, you know, in some small studies to actually reduce some of the severe um, disease that has occurred, um, you know, uh, with, with SARS-CoV-2. So people have taught you, studied, uh, you know, acalbrutinib or, or um, other BTK inhibitors, and they may actually reduce some of the secondary um, hyperinflammatory response that one gets. Um, question for you, Helen. Uh, the auto autoantibodies you identified are they induced by the virus or are they already present in some people? Um, in two patients that were tested before they got SARS-CoV-2, they already had the autoantibodies. Whether increased or not, I mean, I think that needs to be studied in, in more people. But um, we already know when we, I think, sequenced 1,200 individuals pre-COVID, there were four who had autoantibodies. So we think this is a predisposing condition, um, people who have it under certain some circumstances, for instance, during a, a virulent new virus in which you don't have pre-existing responses of any sort that are important, that this will be an issue um, it, to set them up for a severe outcome. But obviously more needs to be done with that. 
Mike, this question might be for you based on the data you've looked at with cross-reactivity for other uh, SARS-type viruses. So are people who survived SARS-1 or, and or MERS infection protected from COVID-19? It's a good question. Uh, this unfortunately pertains to a very, very small number of people, uh, mostly in, in Asia and the Middle East. Uh, seemingly, there is cross-reactivity between uh, at least uh, in the T-cell epitopes for, uh, for, um, for SARS and SARS-CoV-2. Um, uh, for MERS, it's less well-described, uh, but um, unfortunately, the, those, those infections are so, so rare that really it, it unfortunately probably wouldn't be meaningful for the general population. Um, the one, there's one question about shedding in the stool. I'm assuming it's viral shedding in the stool, especially in children with Miss C. Has this been looked at? Maybe Sarah, you can ask, answer that. That's a great question. Um, there's obviously fascinating data in the lay press around using sewage treatment testing to try to drive um, focus on case um, early case reports. I don't. I would assume people are, are accumulating stool, um, but I haven't seen anything published. I may have missed it. Uh, I would assume that that's something people will be looking at in a formal academic way, but I haven't seen it come out yet. I don't know if other folks have seen it come out. All right, I think we've exhausted uh, the questions in the chat. So I would like to thank the panel enormously for your three, four, sorry, four fantastic talks. Thank you so much. And thank you, Sarah, for zooming in from CHOP. Um, and thank you so much to Jeff, Mike, and Helen. I really appreciate you giving such great talks and staying for time so we should could have such a, a lively discussion. So. Thank you very much. And we now have a break um, for lunch and we will be back here at 12.40 Eastern. So we'll see you then. Thank you.